Now, when I talk about hereditarianism, I'm almost always citing peer-reviewed academic papers from traditional journals, not open access journals, and my views are somewhat more hereditary than the consensus, fair enough, but they're well within the normal range for relevant academics on both the existence of biological races in humans and on the heredity of racial gaps in cognitive traits, especially when we include China and the former USSR and the Warsaw Pact into the mix. So my views actually aren't as heterodox as the establishment racists would want you to believe. So I could just leave it at that. I'm not fringe. I'm not nearly as heterodox as you might imagine. Third worldist activists have done a number trying to convince you that any recognition of divergent evolution in humans is some radical view it's not. You go to my website, when I cite my own articles, I'm constantly citing academic peer-reviewed articles. And in these articles, I cite 90% peer-reviewed articles. The rest is government data, Wikipedia, quoting whoever it is I'm criticizing, or some guy's first-hand data collection. Like if I'm going into a government database, for example, and just presenting data entered into Excel, that doesn't need to go to some peer reviewed journal. In fact, I have never seen an academic article ever post an article that's just the raw presentation of data. So if everything must be from a peer reviewed academic journal, then that would disqualify the simple presentation of raw data. And the only people who could ever do any kind of data analysis would be actual academics and it would only be data analysis presented from them in the context of some article about something. So if we limited ourselves to academic peer-reviewed articles, we can never just put up raw data. That's something to keep in mind. And these academics are mostly statistically illiterate. They don't know how to do multiple regressions properly. One big red pill on peer review is to actually use a program like JASP which you can get for free. Maybe you're supposed to pay for it, I don't even know, but I got it for free because I get everything for free. And use it and see how most academic articles just use the default settings on JASP and you realize that the way statistics are done in these academic articles is mostly a function of what the default settings of whatever statistical program they are using. It's not some well-vetted standard that they themselves have independently decided upon. It's just the default settings in JASP or even Excel. Anyway, I'm mostly using peer-reviewed articles. So what I cite is almost all from traditional peer-reviewed academic journals and hereditarianism is mainstream among intelligence researchers and recognition of raciation or subspeciation in humans is, based on surveys of physical anthropologists, biologists, and their textbooks, is a contested topic, not one where there is any kind of consensus. Recognition of biological race is not a fringe view. Race denial is not growing, contrary to how much you have perhaps been gaslighted on the topic, at least not among physical anthropologists worldwide. And that could be the end of all these authority games. But I want to go further than that. I want to deal with what I have dubbed the authoritarian view of knowledge. And this will be hopefully a two-part series, perhaps a three-part series, dealing with the authoritarian view of knowledge. So here I'll deal with a great bugaboo known as peer review. Now, in reality, all papers, all articles are peer reviewed. Even little articles I post on my website, they are in fact peer reviewed, whether they are going through a journal or not. When I post an article on the website, it's almost always vetted by some guy who has a PhD and who has published peer reviewed papers on HBD topics. And researchers, they always send their papers to their peers who look over it, make corrections, try to make things clear. So what is called quote unquote peer review in the formal sense is really just putting your paper in front of a panel of two or three reviewers chosen by some journal's editor to decide whether or not to publish your paper in that journal. It's just gatekeeping and there's no reason to assume that these reviewers know more about what's being talked about in the paper than the author himself. In fact, we would expect not 
we would expect the author to know more about what he's talking about than the reviewers do. So just at a conceptual level, this seems like a rather pointless exercise, as we're to expect the reviewers, who know less about what is being talked about than the author of the paper himself, to judge the veracity of the claims made by the author. All that said, let's just get into it. Let's start with the idea that, say, the more prestigious journals are somehow more rigorous than the less prestigious journals. Now, I'm not talking about open access journals, but comparing traditional review board academic journals with a low impact factor versus those with a high impact factor. High impact factor journals being journals like Nature, Lancet, Science, New England Journal of Medicine. The paper, Prestigious Science Journal, struggled to reach even average reliability. Bjorn Brems looks at various aggregate proxies for article quality that could be applied over a large number of articles and see if higher impact journals appear to have higher quality papers. Of course, how good a paper is is very subjective, but you can do things like look at the statistical power of hundreds of papers, and if one journal repeatedly has lower statistical power, that's a sign of lower quality papers generally. Not conclusive, but it's an arrow pointing that way. And from this, we can look at, say, the statistical power in neuroscience and psychology by journal impact factor based on 730 studies, and the data show no relation between journal rank and statistical power of the study. Another method Brems used was looking at crystallographic quality, or the quality of computer models derived from crystallographic work, and see how often they deviate from known atomic distances. And what is found is that higher impact journals have worse crystallographic work, meaning their molecular models have more errors than do the lower impact factor journals. You could say this is a rather limited measure of a journal's quality, fair enough, and to what extent it's an indicator of other qualities of the journal is unknown. But it's an objective standard for quality, so we can say for sure that lower impact journals have better models of molecules. Of course, what is a good paper or a bad paper, the overall quote unquote quality of the paper, is of course supposed to be answered by the peer review process itself. However, when doing this kind of analysis, we can't use that because that's the very thing under scrutiny. For gene association studies, Brem cites a paper, Munafo 2009, looking at the effect size in gene association studies divided by the pooled effect size estimate from a meta-analysis. The higher the number, the more the study deviates from the results of meta-analyses of the effect sizes of that particular gene candidate. And the larger the circle here, the larger the sample population was used. And what this shows is that higher impact factor journals have smaller samples with bigger effect sizes that aren't replicated. From Zeman 2016, he looked at the rate at which papers in various journals get gene symbols and reference SNPs wrong. In Nature, for example, about one-third of all genetics papers mislabel some bit of genetic data somewhere in the paper. And Zeman found no relation between a journal's impact factor and error rate. And again, it's not that mislabeling a bit of genetic data here or there is a huge deal but it's an objective indicator of quality, even if a small one, which can be seen over thousands of papers. A paper from MacLeod 2015 looked at how often studies had randomized controlled trials and how many of them were double blind in experiments on animals. And what he found was that higher impact journals have roughly the same rate of blinding as low impact journals, but less randomization than low impact journals. And in 2016, Sucks and Ioannidis found a significant correlation between journal impact factor and percent of miscalculated p-values. The percent of a paper with at least one erroneous p-value somewhere in the paper was around 18% for the highest impact journal and around 12% for the lowest impact journals. As for the percentage of all p-values in a given article that were erroneously calculated, the lowest impact journal had an average of around 1.5% of their p-values in any given paper being improperly calculated, while the highest impact factor journals had an average of 3% of their p-values in any given paper erroneously calculated. Again, 
Determining the true quality of a paper is difficult, it's a subjective thing, but these limited objective measures over thousands of papers, over dozens of journals, indicate that the larger journals don't necessarily publish better papers. And this is important because much experimental criticism of peer review has to do with journals of opportunity. Journals which researchers were able to get to go along with the kind of experiment to look at the efficacy of peer review. For example, low inter-rater reliability on review panels. If you were to show that, the establishment racist or someone who otherwise had big faith in the journal system might go, well sure, these journals you were able to use had low inter-rater reliability, but are you looking at the big journals or the smaller ones? If you look at the big journals, they wouldn't have these problems. But there's just no reason to believe that the bigger journals are any more rigorous than the smaller ones. So if researchers find something that calls into question the process of peer review using smaller traditional review board academic journals, not talking about open access journals, but he finds something that calls into question the process using these smaller journals, you can't just wave your arms around and go, oh, well, there's no way that applies to Lancet or Nature because there's just no evidence that the big impact journals are any better. In addition to all this, the larger journals have a higher proportion of retracted papers. This was found in a survey done by Morrison in 2011. Now, it's possible that the higher rate of retraction is a function of having more eyeballs on the high impact journal papers, but certainly the data isn't there that one should just jump to the conclusion that high impact journals are necessarily more rigorous. In the paper Reviewer Bias from Annals of Internal Medicine, the author sent out papers to various journals about transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. The paper they wrote was fake, and they wrote two versions of the paper, one with a positive result and one with a negative result. The positive result paper was submitted to eight journals. The negative result paper was also submitted to eight journals. The reviewers were given a questionnaire and asked to evaluate both studies. And here are the results. So you can see that, in this sample at least, the results matter in terms of how reviewers evaluate the methodology. If they disagree with the result, they are more likely to say the methodology is poor, despite the papers having identical methodologies. A similar manuscript sting was done by Epstein in 1990, and he submitted 146 papers to various journals dealing with social work and what they classed as allied disciplines. It was an identical paper in all instances except for the results showing that social work had positive impact or negative impact on various outcomes they chose. Everything else in the paper was identical. For the positive version, six journals chose to publish, Two were considering possible acceptance, but hadn't decided by the time Epstein's paper came out. For the negative version, only four were willing to publish, and there were no papers in limbo. Moreover, for the negative papers, eight journals outright declined to review, while only four journals declined to review the paper showing positive results for social work. Another example of journals making decisions based on the results of a paper. For allied discipline journals, seven for the positive result papers were accepted for review, while only five of the negative result papers were accepted for review. For positive papers, two were accepted for publication, one was given possible acceptance, and four rejected. For the negative papers, none were accepted for publication, two were considered for possible publication by the time Epstein's paper came out, and three were rejected. So while we see there is an enormous amount of attrition as you go through the process, and you can dismiss the results of any one of these stings as a fluke due to the low numbers that ultimately get through, the fact that we see this phenomena repeatedly on review panels and even on decisions to review, we see them being based on the results of the papers themselves, even though the papers have identical methodologies. In 2010, Emerson, Warren, Wolf, Heckman, Brand and Leopold did a study on the efficacy of a randomized control trial of a form of joint surgery. Again, there are two versions of the paper sent to 238 reviewers, which were identical in everything but the outcome. The two outcomes were a positive effect from the surgery 
and no effect from the surgery. The reviewers were heavily biased towards the paper with positive results. There were also seven errors planted in both versions of the paper. In terms of finding the planted errors in the paper, for the positive version, the reviewers found on average 0.41 errors, and for the no difference version, they found on average 0.85 errors. So on average, the reviewers found less than one of the intentionally planted errors. In terms of method scores, the reviewers rated the positive results paper methodology 8.24, and they rated the negative paper methodology 7.53. In terms of decision to accept the manuscript to even be reviewed in the first place, i.e. even getting to the interview, the reviewers accepted the positive result paper 97.3% of the time for review, and the no difference version of the paper 80% of the time was accepted for review. So again, we see how reviewers evaluate a paper being significantly influenced by the final results. They rate a paper more highly on methodology if they see what they want to see, even with identical methodologies. But another thing this paper does is point out how few of the intentionally planted errors the reviewers actually found. And this was something also found in an internal sting done by the British Medical Journal. Fiona Godley in 2009 sent out a paper to 607 reviewers for the British Medical Journal, a paper with nine intentionally placed major errors and five intentionally placed minor errors. The study looked at the training level for three groups of researchers, a group that wasn't given any training and just told to review the manuscript, one that was given a packet of materials and was self-taught based on this packet of materials, and one that had face-to-face -face reviewer training. There wasn't much difference in the number of errors found, there was some slight improvement, and there was an average of 2.96 total major errors being found. For the five minor errors, an average 0.98 were found. This was better than the detection rate for the journals Clinical Orthopedics and Related Research and the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, but it's still not what I think the average layman or even the average scientist imagines to be the error detection rate when an article gets through a peer review panel. One thing I have heard that peer review actually does more of anything else is find typos. And I personally know a PhD student who has sent papers for peer review who actually sends his papers to me first to find all the typos because he makes quite frankly a horrific number of typos and perhaps because I myself regularly interact with PhDs who have published in traditional not open access peer-reviewed journals one of whom is JF JRP who is literally right here on YouTube that I don't have the kind of magisterial reverence for these kinds of people or for the academic process itself the paper Effect of Blinded Peer Review on Abstract Acceptance looked at the acceptance rate for papers based on author characteristics. This study looked at real papers, over 50,000 over the years this study was done, and looked at the acceptance rate for American Heart Association journals. They even looked at the effects of a switch from open to double-blind peer review, where the reviewer didn't know anything about the author or what institution he came from. So from this, you can see that prestigious institutions were 57.4% more likely to have their papers accepted in the open setting, but only 33.8% more likely to be accepted in the double blind setting. So that looks like a 23.6% advantage for prestigious institutions just for the name, or a 23.6% name premium. Because when they presumably don't know the name, the reviewers view the submissions more similarly. However, there are three studies with five experiments, and the average result is that 41% of the time, the peer reviewer reviewing the paper was able to correctly guess who the author of the paper was. So when taking into account that in the supposedly blind reviews, the reviewers actually knew who the author was 41% of the time. Based on this, we can infer that the true blind results would be even more compressed than this. In this situation, the true blind advantage for prestigious over non-prestigious is only 13.7%, implying that the name advantage of prestigious institutions is really 43.7% over a non-prestigious one. Another way of looking at this is that, given my assumption involving the double-blind true estimate, 
80.59% of the gap between the acceptance of papers from high prestige versus low prestige institution is a function of name premium. This guy went to Yale. And only 19.41% is a result of a true quality difference. Making the journals double blind greatly reduces this effect, but since reviewers can correctly guess who the author is around 41% of the time, we should treat double blind situations as only being 59% blind. In computer science, it's apparently typical to have papers presented at conferences and not journals. And the papers that get presented at the conferences are reviewed by a review panel for the paper to be presented at the conference. In a 2017 paper by Tompkins, Zhang, and Hevelin, they managed to get the 2017 Web Search and Data Mining Conference, which had a 15.6% acceptance rate, to have a single blind where the reviewer knew who the submitting author was, but the author doesn't know who the reviewer is, and a double blind condition where the reviewer also doesn't know who the author was. And they looked to see if the percentage of papers accepted changed based on how famous the author was, or if the author was from a top company or university, or if the author was a female. Basically, authors from high prestige companies and universities who themselves were otherwise famous had a higher likelihood of having their papers accepted if the reviewer knew who they were than if the reviewer was blind. And what was found is that if you were from a top company, your paper was 2.1 times more likely to be accepted if the reviewer knew who you were than if he didn't. If you were a famous researcher, the premium was 1.63. And if you were from an elite university, the premium was 1.58. And if you were a woman, you were only 0.78 times as likely as a man to have your paper accepted. Now again, going back to that 41% number from other studies, reviewers are able to correctly identify the author of a paper around 41% of the time. So if we apply that number here, just doing basic algebra, we get the quote unquote true benefit from single blinding at 2.86 for being from a top company, 2.07 for being a famous individual, 1.98 for being at an elite university, and for women, 0.63. So women actually suffer a malice. Interestingly, this paper found that women were discriminated against. And this is one of the few pieces of actual data showing real gender discrimination that I've been able to find. Usually gender discrimination goes like this. Lived experience, fewer women in STEM, right? And the data says, no, they're not discriminated against. They're actually given a bonus. But here it looks like there really is gender discrimination and apparently they did a follow-up analysis where they were able to get the re this result to be statistically significant. So there's a unicorn, actual empirically validated gender discrimination against women. But more importantly, this shows just more prestige bias in the peer review process when not effectively double-blinded. Evidence that much of what decides which papers get accepted and don't get accepted have to do with credential factors, not with the quality of the paper itself. Another thing to look at is how much do raters of papers in the peer review process actually agree with each other? Because if the people rating the papers wildly diverge in how favorably they evaluate a paper, would this not call into question the process? If this is supposed to be some ironclad objective razor that grinds away bad papers and bad arguments within papers, wouldn't we expect the raters on a review panel to come to more or less the same conclusion on any given paper, given that their objections are supposedly entirely methodological and standardized. Of course, we've already seen that's probably not true given the premium that famous authors and prestigious institutions get independent of the quality of the paper itself. Well, Bornman, Mutz, and Daniel did a meta-analysis of 48 studies on inter-rater reliability, and they found the mean inter-rater reliability was 0.34. An inter-rater reliability of zero would be completely random, and an inter-rater reliability of one would be that the raters all had identical judgments of each paper they received. So what we can say is that the reviews someone gets on a paper is more random than uniform, i.e. they are mostly random. One question that should be pretty obvious to ask is how do we know studies published in academic journals are actually any better than studies that aren't published in academic journals? 
Rune Elvik looked at this question looking at papers on road safety and he compared peer-reviewed versus not peer-reviewed papers published on this topic. And he came up with a bunch of operationalized criteria to determine qualities of these papers. And the papers published in the academic journals generally had better sample sizes, but that was it. He looked at 44 papers published in academic journals and 79 published papers in non-peer-reviewed journals. And what he found was, based on the criteria he used, there was no significant difference on these criteria between the academic journal papers and non-peer-reviewed papers, with the exception of sample size. A note from Jefferson, Alderson, and Wagner in their paper entitled Effects of Editorial Peer Review, they noted on Elvik's analysis, which they included in their general analysis of effects of peer review, they said, quote, This is the only identified study addressing the effects of peer review on validity. The author did not attempt to adjust for potential confounders. Now, this should be a rather eye-popping statement. The only one he found? Given the gravity of import that establishment races place on the journal system, you would think that the journal system was some well-vetted, well-proven system to improve the quality of papers. You'd think this kind of thing that Elvik is doing would be done all the time in a wide variety of topics. I'm not saying that we know for sure that this is in fact the only paper comparing peer-reviewed papers to non-peer-reviewed papers, but given that this was the only one that they were able to find, it's evidence that there aren't that many, which is evidence that researchers really haven't bothered much to investigate if peer-reviewed papers actually give better results or more valid results than non-peer-reviewed papers, and if so, by what margin? And even if you could say that being peer-reviewed is a predictor of a paper being somewhat better, well, you have to ask by what margin? And how important is being peer-reviewed compared to other factors? And is it even causal? Because it could be the case that peer-reviewed papers are better simply because the kinds of people who write papers that they ultimately send out to journals just tend to be better papers, and those papers would still be better whether they were sent to a journal or not. So, to my constant and continuing surprise, almost no scientists know anything about the evidence on peer review. It's a process that's central to science, deciding which grant proposals are gonna get funded, which papers are gonna be published, who's gonna get promoted, who's gonna get a Nobel Prize. And so we might expect that scientists who after all are trained to believe nothing until they're presented with the evidence on it, would want to know what the evidence is on peer review, this central process. Yet not only do scientists know so little about the evidence on peer review, but they continue to believe in peer review, thinking that it's essential for the progress of science. It's ironically a faith-based rather than evidence-based process that lies at the heart of science. Now, perhaps you don't want to listen to me when I say that as I am, according to Vouch, a known lying Nazi. Well, okay, maybe you'd want to listen to Richard Smith, who was the lead editor for the British Medical Journal from 1991 to 2004, and hear what he has to say about this. Quote, To my continuing surprise, almost no scientists know anything about the evidence on peer review. It is a process that is central to science, deciding which grant proposals will be funded, which papers will be published, who will be promoted, and who will receive a Nobel Prize. We might thus expect that scientists, people who are trained to believe nothing until presented with evidence, would want to know all the available evidence on this important process. Yet not only do scientists know little about the evidence on peer review, but most continue to believe in peer review, thinking it essential for the progress of science. Ironically, a faith-based rather than an evidence-based process lies at the heart of science. If you enjoyed this video, please consider donating either to me via Subscribestar or to my good friend Cool Tapes, who posts a cool picture. He seems to post a cool picture every time I post a video. I don't know if that's a coincidence or what. Upcoming videos planned are the second part of the authoritarian view of knowledge, a video response to Three Arrows, and describing what the enemies of civilization really are, the establishment racists. Not liberal, not left-wing, not progressive, or any other self-congratulatory title. It's time to stop calling them these neutral or even positive names, but to take off the mask and show them for the ultra-capitalist, racial revanchists they truly are. Thanks for watching, and have a nice day.